Hello, I'm Bob Wilhelm. I am an iconographer and a hagiographer. That is, I write and I tell stories, sacred stories. One of the difficulties with writing stories and telling stories, painting stories, is that there are traditions around stories and sometimes those traditions are helpful and sometimes they're not. For example, there is really no tradition in the West for pictures of a woman called Katiri Tekawitha. She was a Mohawk Indian. She lived in the 17th century. She was converted to Christianity um, and led a very ascetic life and died when she was only 24 years old. Kateri is in the process in the Roman Catholic Church of being canonized. Uh, Blessed Kateri someday will be Saint Kateri Tekawitha. The question about Kateri for an iconographer is how do you portray her? I was asked to tell stories of Native American saints, Native born American saints. And one of the stories was the story of Katiri. I actually had never told the story before. Kelly, my wife, tells the story of Katiri when she tells stories of women saints. So I had heard her tell the story a number of times. But now that I was to tell the story, I had to make the story my own and I had to find a perspective for telling the story. I had time, and with that time, I also decided to paint an icon of Kateri. And so the process evolved over a number of weeks, weeks in which I did background research, I imagined a painting, an icon of her, and slowly, very, very slowly, it emerged. Finally, The icon was completed, but the story of its symbols, its images, is a very um, rich and complex story. Let me tell you a little bit about it. The pictures of Kateri that you can find in a, a bookstore or a religious good shop tend to be pictures of someone who essentially looks like a, a Caucasian woman, a pretty young white woman dressed romantically in buckskin. Um, and that certainly was not how she looked. And from knowing her story, it was not the kind of person she was. Now, among Native peoples in North America who are Christian, specifically Catholic, she is a very popular saint. Uh, an unofficial saint, but very popular because she is one of the native peoples. And so they tend to express who she is in art that fits the local group. In front of the cathedral in Santa Fe, in New Mexico, there's a magnificent, a beautiful statue of Kateri outside. The only problem is that she looks like a Pueblo Indian from New Mexico. And so in thinking about Kateri, I struggled with how was I going to do this? I'm not going to tell her story here, but bits of her story will come through with the icon. One of the things was that um, she isn't a saint yet. And I couldn't quite put a halo around her, though I consider her to be a saint. And so I thought, well, I didn't know what I was thinking. I stayed with that. Halo, no halo. What to do? And out of that came the decision to do what looks like half a, a halo for a blessed rather than a saint. But more importantly, it also looks like a phase of the moon. And I thought that this woman, so rooted in the natural world, that it was appropriate that her halo should be a phase of the moon. I had to find her face, and I couldn't find a face. I 
looked at faces of contemporary Iroquois and Mohawk people, many of whom have intermarried with um, uh, other peoples from other parts of the world. And so they tend not to look Indian, or certainly they tend not to look like Kateri would have looked. Well, I was eager to find someone who looked like a Native American for this picture, um, how she might have looked and finally found one of those wonderful photographs by Curtis, the photographer uh, of native peoples. And one struck me, it was a look in the eyes, a look on the face of a Native American young woman from Arizona, from one of the tribes in Arizona. And that became my inspiration for this picture of Kateri. I also had to find the symbols and iconography you you surround the face and the hands of an individual person, a, a holy person, a saint, a model, with symbols that say a little bit about who they are. It's to communicate the story non-narratively. It's not like a motion picture, or it's not like a picture book where you move from one picture to another and the story develops. In an icon, all the pictures have to be there at the same time. The whole story has to be present at the same time. And so you choose things that somehow speak for everything. There's also a, a sense of timelessness with icons for this reason. They are not narratives. They do not tell stories from beginning through middles to ends, but they present a, a one-time glimpse, a snapshot that doesn't change. Kateri always has that look on her face that she does in this icon. She's always holding the wampum belt. The birds do not move, including the one in mid-flight. There's a stillness and a centeredness about icons. Choosing the symbols for the icons was difficult. No model in the Eastern Church, no model in the Western Church, except, oh, holy cards, historical cards that seem to be off the mark or seem to come from some other Native American tradition that had little to do with this woman who lived in the Northeast in upstate New York, who was rooted in the cycle of nature of her time and her place, her piece of earth. So the symbols are there. They were gathered slowly. Most visible is, I think, the wampum belt. Among the Iroquois people, wampum belts were very intricate objects, beadwork essentially, with very important designs on them. They marked history. They were like the scrolls of Israel, um, retelling the story. They were gifts. They were, they were. Uh, the bonds of treaties between people, a very unique kind of sacred object that cannot be translated into anything else in the world. And in this wampum belt, we see the uh, symbol of the cross in the center, for that was her decision, that was her way, along with the geometric patterns of life that would reflect the ways of her people. Kateri was a woman who lived in two worlds, the world of Christianity and the world of native wisdom, as well as among two peoples, the Mohawk, one of the five nations of the Iroquois, and also with the French, the Canadians. She belonged to the turtle clan, and the turtle is included there. It's the wood turtle. It was hard to find the right turtle for this. I needed to discover what turtles were dominant in the Albany area where the Hudson River begins to flow down to the sea. The snapping turtle is used for rattles among the Iroquois people. But the character of the snapping turtle wasn't quite right for Kateri. It's considered to be a very wise turtle, a clever turtle, uh, a less belligerent turtle. And with its unique pink coloring of its flesh, it seemed to be right. 
This was the clan that she belonged to, the clan being a smaller division of the larger tribe. She was evangelized by the French, and so there is the French flag, uh, now the flag of the province of Quebec in, in Canada, but also uh, a sign and a symbol of the black robe missionaries, the Jesuit missionaries who came to North America and who converted many of the Iroquois, including Kateri. The fleur-de-lis is the symbol. Uh, it is symbolic religiously as well, though most people don't realize this. The four could also stand for the three persons of the Trinity and Mary, the mother of God. I chose to take that fourth one and distinguish it separated from the others by giving it a golden color. But that is not the color that the flag of the province of Quebec has. She's wearing a blue mantle, very frequently associated with Mary, especially in the Western church. The reason she wears this is we have some primitive sketches done by the black robes, the Jesuits, uh, showing her and where she lived in the world. When she went to Canada and saw the sisters wearing their religious garb, she made the decision to wear the garb of the nuns for she wanted to dedicate and devote her life to that of constant prayer and virginity and devotion to Christ. And so rather than having her in a, in a buckskin cloth, which is very romantic, but which is not something she wore, I put her in the, the robe of a nun as a robe that she wore, that she clothed herself with, uh, with the, uh, the white uh, blouse dress underneath it. And uh, the other thing that needed to be done were the symbols, other symbols of the natural world. And the symbols are two one of the world of um, the heavenly world of the birds above and the other of the green growing world both of which are very important in Kateri's life one of the incidents in her later life and it was a very short life of only 24 years was she practiced penitential rites um, mistakenly I think judged these days as a kind of a sadomasochistic uh, form of spirituality. But you must remember that in her time, the Iroquois people, a warrior people, played, placed great importance on physical discipline in order to, uh, uh, to live up to their ideal of being warriors. Uh, they did not flinch from suffering and pain and imposed suffering and pain upon them as training. The same way the Jesuits at that time, the black robes, also were penitentials. And Kateri certainly wanted to emulate their spirituality. She had accepted baptism, she was baptized, and she saw the black robes as being practice, practitioners par excellence of the right of Christ and seeing their penitential, they're wearing hair shirts and doing other things that we associate with medieval Christianity and are a bit uncomfortable with, was not a problem for Kateri, for she was a warrior. So the tree behind her is the prickly ash. It's really more of a bush than it is a tree. It's native to her part of the world in upstate New York. And she took the branches, the winter branches of the prickly ash and made a bed of thorns for herself as her way of disciplining herself and uh, her way of following the way of Christ who was crowned with thorns. She would of course have seen many pictures and statues of him with thorns and being wed to him mystically in her soul, she would have wanted to share that. She would have wanted to wear the thorns as well. Indeed, her practice was so severe that the Jesuit priests themselves had to uh, counsel her to moderate that practice for her health's sake. The prickly ash is portrayed here in all its seasons. The barren uh, 
prickly ash of winter, the green leaves of uh, summer, up above the light blossoms of springtime, and finally the dark reddish berries of autumn. The cycle of the year, like the cycle of the moon and her halo. The uh, final image is that of the hermit thrush. And there's a wonderful story that I will someday post on this website, an Iroquois story of who the hermit thrush was in their tales of creation. And my own feeling was, the more I read about Kateri, was that she was like a hermit thrush. The hermit thrush hides. It is not easily seen. It's a tiny, very tiny bird, as she was a tiny woman very indescript uh, in its coloring, and yet it has the most magnificent and beautiful song. Indeed, it was so beautiful that Walt Whitman felt that it should have been the national bird, not the eagle that we have, or even the turkey that Ben Franklin wanted as our national bird, but the beautiful hermit thrush with its song. And when he wrote his poem following the death of Abraham Lincoln, when Lincoln's body was being taken across the country from Washington um, up the East Coast and then west all the way to Illinois for burial, across Iroquois lands actually, uh, he has the hermit thrush singing its song as it accompanies Lincoln's journey home. And um, so this bird is a very Native American bird in all senses of that word from cultural to political. And I wanted to include that bird in, in the icon, because uh, again, I see her as a hermit thrush with the beauty of her song and the simplicity of her life. So there are the four eggs, uh, four because of the symbolism of uh, fourfoldness, the four directions that are so important in Native American lore and ritual. It also balances the flag, the fleur-de-lis with its four. And another thing about the fleur-de-lis is that she is often called the lily of the Mohawk. Um, there's a story that lilies grew on her grave. But the real reason, most likely, for her being called lily of the Mohawk was that the fleur-de-lis is a lily. And by uh, living in two worlds, both the native world and the world of Christianity, as represented by the French and their symbol of the fleur-de-lis. She became the flower, the lily, the lily of the Mohawk. And of course, I had to, um, to, go back, oh, to go back to the turtle. The turtle is also seen as the basis of reality in Native American mythology. The world is built on turtle's back. And so it's another reason why the turtle is here. It's solid. It's rooted in, in this land. My final reflection is the initials on the top, Katiri Tekawitha. Katiri is the Iroquois pronunciation of Catherine. She was baptized Catherine. And the name Tekawitha is not a family name. It's a descriptive name, as it is among, um, among people, uh, native people. And it essentially is one who finds her way, one who feels her way. Uh, because, and this is part of her story that, again, I hope to include on this page someday in the future, she was blinded by smallpox and uh, as a little girl, as an infant almost. Her mother and her father died, her older brother died, and, and she recovered, but she was terribly pockmarked on her face. Uh, and by the way, that's why I did not include that, because there's a tradition that when she died, the pockmarks disappeared. And of course, in the kingdom of heaven, the signs of suffering are gone. And so her face would be transformed from what it was to what it could be. Uh, so the, the uh, uh, Tekawitha then is, um, is, describes this one woman who was almost blind. That's also what the smallpox did. It's why she took to gathering, uh, working um, with very close work. It seems she could see things close up, but not far away. And so she did hand work, such as uh, the kind of things like were made into wampum belts. 
it's a long story. It's a long story about how this icon came to be and how it came to be in what I hope was faithfulness to the iconic tradition of the Christian churches and yet respectful and sensitive to the story, the actual story of Kateri as a, a visionary, courageous warrior, young woman whose voice was so gentle like the hermit thrush. I'm Bob Wilhelm. I'm a storyteller and an iconographer.